mutations occurred at random throughout the distribution. For example, I mentioned that some cichlids lay their eggs by attaching them to the roof of a cave. Now that means those eggs are actually different. Normally uh, a cichlid egg is just sticky all over when it's first laid. And so whatever it's laid onto, it sticks. So if it's top of flat rock, it sticks to the top of flat rock. But those cichlids which attach their eggs to the roof of a cave, the eggs are not sticky all over. They just have a sticky rod at one end, which they pop onto the roof as they lay it, and, it, and of course it sticks. Now cichlids with that particular adaptation of the egg, well there's a species of that adaptation in South America, there's a species in Africa, a species in the Middle East, and a species in Sri Lanka. And that what I found was absolutely typical. The same variations were occurring like that all over the range. And it was impossible to trace any evolutionary lines of descent. You just had random permutations throughout the range of a relatively small number of characteristics. Nothing new seemed to be generated anywhere. Even those teeth variations, the same variation teeth were cropping up all over the place. And again, I found when you look at the literature, that's exactly what you find in every group of animals and plants. That same kind of mosaic distribution of variation. Evolution or creation. Organisms just drawing endlessly on a common pool of variation, which they all have access, in one, access to in one, one way or another. Now, let me tell you an interesting story. I told you that some cichlids lay their eggs on the ground and just look after them in a normal way. Others brood them in their mouths. Well, scientists would probably never think of doing this, but people who keep aquarium fish and all the journals and magazines they write for, of course, think of doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So, of course, numerous aquarium keepers have thought the idea, what happens if you swap these over? What happens if you give eggs from substrate brooders to mouth brooders? Or if you give the young from mouth brooders to substrate brooders? You know, you wait till the, the two species are at the same stage in their breeding cycle and swap them over. Well, amazingly, you find that substrate brooding parents, when they find that they've suddenly got a load of young who are hitting at their mouths wanting to get in, they beatily open their mouths and seem to know exactly what to do. And similarly the other way around. And all sorts of experiments have been done like that. So you find that even species in the group which do not naturally show a particular behaviour know what it is and know how to perform it if they're called upon to do so. And again, that's typical of what you find in, in other kinds of animals and plants. Or oh, not, not plants, but in, in animals. And so, in fact, you know, I came to the conclusion, how do you know whether animals are members of the same kind? Well, you ask them. Do they recognise each other as members of the same kind? If they do, they are. If they don't, they're not. And cichlids recognise all other cichlids as cichlids and know how to reproduce any behaviour you find in the kind. I was also interested in the whole subject of heredity. Well, I was actually working towards, but I never got there because time ran out and I got distracted by all the other things I've been talking about. Cichlids are just, just delightful animals. Uh, but what I was actually interested in was heredity. Uh, I wanted to start doing some uh, hybridization experiments, not breeding experiments, but experiments where I could take the nucleus from the egg of one species to put it into the nucleated egg cell of another species to see, see what happens there. So you're, you're taking the genetics of one form to get with the rest of the, the, the cell of another. And uh, I got as far as demonstrating that one could definitely do that in cichlids and that fish were very suitable organisms to do this. And the advantage of fish is that their eggs on the whole are transparent. So when the fish are developing, you can follow the whole development in exquisite detail. You can see right through them under the microscope and see all the details of the heart and the internal structures and everything else. It's quite late on the development that the pigment forms and then become opaque. Um, so, so fish, you know, unlike uh, 
you know, many other organisms are a delight to follow the early development. And I want to talk a little bit about that, about that because uh, I was looking at the tremendous evidence that exists that DNA is actually responsible for very little in heredity. And as Darwinism is entirely based on the assumption that DNA is the be-all and end-all in heredity, that is obviously an interesting point. What I was going to say, this is one of the main things I was interested in. I wanted to know about Rekers on the assumption that there are distinct kinds of animals and plants. And of course, I was interested as a scientist in knowing what is responsible for it. What's the, what's the mechanism that, that guarantees their distinctiveness or that underwrites it? You know, just again to make the point, because if you believe in creation as opposed to evolution, that doesn't mean you don't have scientific questions you want answered. Of course you do. There are still endless things that you want to investigate. Uh, the fact that you believe in creation doesn't mean there aren't mechanisms of heredity that you want to understand and see what's happening here. If there are limits, then what sets the limits? Why are there limits? But Darwinism is, is based on what I'd call genetic reductionist model of organisms. It's on the assumption that DNA is the sole carrier of information in heredity and development. And that all the characteristics of an organism are encoded in its DNA, that DNA is some kind of blueprint or, or recipe, and those are the kinds of words that are used. DNA is God and RNA and his prophet, is how my biology lecturer at Birmingham University put it. Though he didn't actually believe it. And then the idea is that mutations in the DNA, base changes in the DNA at root, lead to new organisms and so explain the evolution and descent of all living things. So clearly if you accept that DNA model, that DNA is responsible for coding in some way all the characteristics of an organism, whether as recipe or as blueprint, then obviously you've got the basis of a theory of evolution, a scientific theory. Changes in the DNA produces changes in the organisms, etc. Everything flows from there. Uh, and yet, an unknown secret here, that neo-Darwinian paradigm has been known to be false, unquestionably false, irrefutably false, for over 50 years. I'd say the decisive year when the evidence became overwhelming was 1954. Uh, when a guy called Tracy Sonneborn published his final paper in his research after about 20 years of, of research. And it's all to do with what's often called cortical inheritance. So uh, cortex is just a name given to the, the cell membrane round cells and part of the cytoplasmic structure underneath. So it's a bit of a vague term and probably today not a terribly useful term, but, but that's what it was historically referring to. And in fact, until the 1930s, it was commonly believed by biologists that the genes do not determine the fundamental feature of an organism's body plan. And many developmental biologists still agree with that. And the, the evidence comes from lots of groups of animals, but the key group of organisms on which all the key research was done was the ciliates. That's our microscopic single-celled animals and those of you who have ever done biology at school or university will at least have come across paramecium, the slipper animalcule. It's microscopic. Uh, or vorticella, or tetrahymena, or stentor. Uh, you know, those are some of the, probably the best known one ones. So if any of you have ever done biology at school or university, you will come across at least some of, some of those. And as you can see by looking at those pictures, they've got quite a complex cell surface structure. They're covered in tiny hairs for a start, cilia, which uh, moves them along. And these cilia you know, are in uh, patterns around the organism. That uh, bottom uh, left picture there just shows the rows of, of, of cilia. They've been stained to, to appear up. And the other just shows you the very complex structure of these organisms. They've got quite a complex structure, and particularly the cell surface structure. And by the 1950s, it was proven beyond doubt that the ciliate cell surface structures and their patterns were inherited independently of genes and DNA. How was this done? Quite easily. You can just perform little surgical operations on these animals and 
say remove some structures or replace